Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to this Physiology Rapid Review Lecture. Uh, my name is Mustafa Ali and I'm a fourth year medical student. Uh, I'll be teaching hematology part two. So the topics of this, of this lecture will be platelets and their functions, uh, hemostasis, so we'll be covering primary and secondary hemostasis. Uh, we'll talk a bit about hemocoagulation, uh, the anti-clotting mechanism, and then finally to conclude the lecture will be about the blood group system. So platelets. Platelets are also known as thrombocytes. However, this term thrombocytes is is inaccurate. Uh, it's inaccurate because this suggests that uh, platelets are cells. However, they are not actually cells, they are fragments of cells called megakaryocytes. So what happens is that uh, portions of uh, the cytoplasm of megakaryocytes, uh, they, leave the, they leave the cell and are surrounded by plasma membrane. And these are then called uh, platelets. So platelets are small, approximately two to four micrometers in diameter. Uh, so as they are not cells, they have no nucleus um, and they do not undergo protein synthesis. They have a lifespan of about eight to 10 days. Uh, the normal range of platelets uh, is between 150,000 to 400,000. This can, this varies, uh, can be up to 450,000 uh, per microliters of blood. Uh, so anything more than this range, so more than 400,000 or 440,000, per microliter of blood uh, means that a person is thrombo a person has thrombocytosis. Um, if a person's platelet count is less than 150,000 per microliter of blood, this means the person has thrombocytopenia. So platelets uh, usually have uh, one main function and that is uh, their involvement in hemostasis uh, and hemostasis is a process which involves the repairing of damaged blood vessels. Uh, platelets also release uh, growth factors growth factors for healing and repair of damaged tissue, uh, particularly connective tissue. So what is hemostasis? Hemostasis is the natural process of wound healing. Uh, this occurs to prevent blood loss when a blood vessel injury occurs. Um, usually this is the case for smaller, uh, or, uh, smaller vessels, uh, whereas larger blood vessels um, and arteries, they re would require surgical intervention. Uh, primary hemostasis, this, so there's two parts to hemostasis. There's primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis involves two um, steps or mechanisms. Uh, the first one is called vascular spasm and the second one is uh, platelet plug formation. So vascular spasm occurs first and then the platelet plug formation and then uh, you enter into secondary hemostasis. This, the purpose of this is to further stabilize the platelet plug that is formed in primary hemostasis. And this occurs by, um, by blood coagulation, uh, creating a blood clot. So primary hemostasis um, 
Um, when a blood vessel is ruptured, a uh, vascular spasm occurs. So what is vascular spasm? Vascular spasm is basically uh, a vessel constriction of the damaged blood vessel. The smooth muscle in the blood vessel contracts. Uh, it, it contracts to constrict the blood flow to that area. This will ultimately reduce uh, or attempt to reduce the uh, excessive blood loss. Uh, however, this is uh, this is a brief action um, and typically only lasts for about thirty minutes. Um, so, what is vascular spasm caused by? It is believed to be triggered by um, chemicals that are called endothelins, uh, and these are released by the damaged endothelium in response to vessel injury. So the second step of primary hemostasis is platelet plug formation. In, in this uh, step, the platelets become activated and they create a plug over the rupture site and like like you can see in this diagram um, the disrupted endothelium releases a protein which is called von Willebrand's factor uh, and this attaches to the exposed underlying collagen of the surrounding tissue uh, the platelets that are circulating in the blood, they come into contact with the von Willebrand's factor and then they bind to it. When they bind to it, they become activated. Um, platelets are normally uh, in the shape of a disc. So when they become activated, they, they change shape and they become spiked and they become sticky. Uh, so they can clump together with more stability and this is known as platelet adhesion. So activated, activated platelets, they also release serotonin. Uh, this attracts more platelets. They also release calcium two plus ions. This is needed for the secondary hemostasis. They also release ADP, adenosine diphosphate and thromboxane A2, both of these which activate other platelets in the bloodstream to um, become involved in the platelet plug formation. Um, so many platelets uh, become activated, they all clump together and they aggregate together over this wound, uh, open wound in the blood vessel and they form this platelet plug uh, to stop the bleeding. However, this just a platelet plug on its own is usually not enough and uh, and requires um, blood clotting to be, to become stable and uh, to prevent uh, the rupture of the vessel again. Um, so secondary hemostasis is uh, when this blood clotting occurs. Um, it's also called hemocoagulation or blood coagulation or blood clotting. So co coagulation is the process by which the blood forms a gelatinous clot over the damaged area of a blood vessel. Uh, like I said, this occurs in secondary hemostasis uh, to further stabilize the platelet plug that is formed in primary hemostasis. Um, hemocoagulation um, involves uh, involves two separate pathways um, that that work simultaneously, um, which are and these are called intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Both of these pathways they eventually merge to form the common pathway. Um, the difference between these two pathways is just in the location of the uh, in the coagulation factors that are involved in these pathways. 
um, but the end product of both pathways is the same. So what are coagulation factors? So coagulation factors are just substances. They are mainly proteins that interact with each other to promote blood coagulation. So the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. Um, so all the coagulation factors, all the clotting factors that are required for this pathway, they are they are located in within the bloodstream. Uh, I.e., they are intrinsic to the blood. Uh, so the pathway is uh, when a blood vessel becomes damaged, it causes factor twelve to become activated. So coagulation factor 12 becomes actu uh, activated um, uh, when it comes into contact with the uh, activated platelets or the exposed collagen. So the platelets are activated from primary hemostasis uh, when they form the platelet plug or there is already or when there is exposed collagen um, and factor 12 which is circulating in the blood just like all the other coagulation factors for uh, the intrinsic pathway um, it comes into contact with the either the activated platelets or the exposed collagen and it becomes activated um, just a side note for these coagulation factors um, as you can see in this diagram, mostly they are um, they are given Roman numerals. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Um, so factor twelve A um, then then goes on to activate factor eleven coagulation factor eleven, um, which turn, which becomes eleven A. Factor eleven A then activates factor 9, which becomes factor 9A, i.e. Active, activated factor 9. Uh, factor 9A then joins with activated factor 8 and a calcium 2 plus iron as a cofactor to form a complex which activates factor 10 uh, to become factor, activated factor 10A. Uh, the factor 8 here that joins with the factor 9a is activated separately um, by for example thrombin. Uh, thrombin is a coagulation factor um, involved in the common pathway which we'll come on to later on. Um, and then factor 10a is the final product of the intrinsic pathway uh, and from here is when the common pathway begins. The next is the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Um, the main coagulation factor for this pathway is required that is required for this pathway is located in the smooth muscle cells of the blood cell of the blood vessels. Um, this pathway is more often initiated when trauma occurs to the surrounding tissue. Uh, this causes damage to the blood vessels and it, it exposes the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels. Um, when the smooth muscle uh, cells are exposed, they release the uh, coagulation factor. And this coagulation factor is called tissue factor. It's um, it's also known as factor 3 or tissue thromboplastin. So this is the main coagulation factor involved in extrinsic pathway. Um, it's more commonly known as tissue factor, um, but its numerical term is factor 3 or it's also called tissue thromboplastin and it is located within the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels. Um, so upon damage, the blood vessels are, are damaged and the smooth muscle cells are exposed. Uh, these then lead to the release of tissue factor. 
so then this tissue factor forms a complex with activated factor 7, i.e. factor 7a. Factor 7 is a um, coagulation factor located within the blood, within the bloodstream, and it is proteolytically activated uh, into its active form. Um, so now you have this complex uh, tissue, fi tissue factor, factor 7A complex. Uh, this also requires calcium 2 plus iron as a cofactor, and this complex then activates factor 10 into factor 10A, uh, and then again, this is where the common pathway begins. So the, similar, the, the similarity between the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway is that at the end they have the same product of factor 10a. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that they both form a complex to activate factor 10. Um, extrinsic pathway is the complex is a tissue factor, factor 7a complex which requires calcium 2 plus as a cofactor, uh, whereas in the intrinsic pathway, it was a factor 9A and factor 8A um, complex along with calcium 2 plus iron, uh, which activates factor 10. Um, just a uh, a way to remember the extrinsic pathway um, that and the coagulation factors are involved in this. Uh, think of three plus seven equals ten. Um, so factor three, which is tissue factor, and factor seven A, they combine to form a complex, um, which then activates factor ten into ten A. So now, uh, once factor 10 is activated, um, we reach the we enter into the common pathway of blood coagulation. Uh, the both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways they merge at this level, and this leads on to the end of the coagulation process. Um, so the pathway is that factor 10a, so activated factor 10. Um, combines with activated factor 5 uh, to form a complex. This complex is called a prothrombin activator, uh, and this again requires calcium 2 plus iron as a cofactor. Uh, so now you have this complex formed, which is called a prothrombin activator, and it is formed. Um, and it is made up of a factor 10a and factor 5a. So as the name suggests, uh, this complex activates pro prothrombin. Prothrombin is factor 2, coagulation factor 2. Um, and the activated form of factor 2 is 2a. Uh, so the name of this 2a is thrombin. So Prothrombin activator activates prothrombin into thrombin. Um, thrombin, which is activated factor 2, then activates factor 1. Factor 1 is called fibrinogen. The activated form of fibrinogen is called fibrin, which is 1A. Fibrinogen is insoluble, sorry, fibrinogen is soluble in blood, but fibri fibrin is insoluble. So this is able to form cross-linked chains over the platelet plug uh, to result in a blood clot. So as you can see in this diagram, red blood cells are clumped together by a mesh of fibrin. Uh, to create this blood clot. Um, a thrombin, uh, which is factor 2a, uh, 
uh, can also activate factor 13. Uh, factor 13, the name for factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor. Uh, and as the name suggests, it uh, stabilizes uh, or reinforces the blood clot or the fibrin uh, around the blood clot. Uh, this ultimately, so the end of the coagulation, common path or pathway of coagulation results in a uh, stable, a stable thrombus. Thrombus is the um, is is what a blood clot is called. Uh, and it is also called a red thrombus as uh, red blood cells are trapped within this fibrin, fibrin mesh. Uh, an easy way to remember the coagulation factors for common pathway is to think 10 uh, divide, divided by 5 equals 2 multiplied by 1. Um, so 10 divided by 5 equals 2 times 1. Factors 10a and 5a, they form a complex um, that activates factor 2 into 2a, um, which then activates factor 1 into 1a. So I know there's a quite a lot of um, coagulation factors to remember. Uh, but if you try to remember these, um, you can think of them as hints. Uh, so for the intrinsic pathway, for extrinsic pathway is 3 plus 7 equals 10. And for the common pathway, it is 10 divided by 5 equals 2 times 1. Uh, and it will just trigger your memory into thinking, uh, into remembering what the coagulation factors are. Okay, so I hope that is um, understandable. I've just included these diagrams, which I think are quite nice uh, to explain the whole system of hemostasis, uh, sorry, of secondary hemostasis. Um, So you can see here is the intrinsic pathway uh, and from here the extrinsic pathway starts. Extrinsic pathway is uh, mainly just a tissue factor um, combining with factor 8a uh, to form a complex which activates factor 10 into 10a um, and intrinsic factor is it involves um, a few more coagulation factors to remember. Um, uh, and so you start with factor 12 into 12a, um, which then activates factor 11 into 11a, and then factor 9 into 9a, and then factor 10 into 10a. And then the secondary hemostasis. Um, which involves factor 10a combining with factor 8, factor 5a, sorry, um, to activate prothrombin into thrombin. Uh, thrombin then activates fibrinogen into fibrin, um, and they, and then the blood clot is formed as the fibrin, which is insoluble, which is insoluble material. Uh, traps the red blood cells and the platelet flow. Um, um, I think this diagram on the right is a little more uh, simpler to, to see. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, anti-clotting mechanism. Um, and this anticlotting mechanism is called the fibrinolytic system. Um, so the fibrinolytic system involves the process of fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis is the enzymatic breakdown of a fibrin and it is mediated by an enzyme called plasmin. This plasmin is derived from plasminogen. 
fibrinolysis is the natural breakdown of blood clots, which occurs after the wound has healed. If blood clots do not break down, they, they uh, this can lead on to complications such as a uh, deep vein thrombosis, or they can embolize, break, uh, meaning they can break off and travel to other parts of the uh, body, uh, such as the heart, the lungs, and uh, and even the brain, which can lead to uh, pulmonary embolus uh, and or a stroke. So the process of fibrinolysis is that um, there are two fibrin fibrinolytic chemicals that are released, urokinase uh, by the kidneys and tissue plasminogen activator or TPA from endothelial cells. Both of these chemicals, they cleave plasminogen into plasmin, uh, which is the proteolytic enzyme. Uh, plasmin, uh, plasmin breaks down the fibrin mesh around the blood clots. Uh, this then results in the dissolving of the blood clots and, and release of um, the degradation products, mainly the dimers. To regulate fibrinolysis, plasminogen activator inhibitor uh, is released to inhibit the tissue plasminogen activator. So now um, we'll talk about the ABO blood group system. So the ABO blood group system uh, arises from the fact that people have either one, two or no antigens on their surfaces, on the surfaces of their blood, red blood cells. So what are the two, anti there are two antigens that are involved in this uh, blood group system, A antigen and B antigen. So people who have A antigens on their red blood cells are designated the blood type of A. People with B antigens on their red blood cells are designated the blood type of B. Those people who have both A and B antigens on their red blood cells, they are said to be a B blood type. And those people who have neither a nor B antigens on their red blood cells are designated the blood type O. These antigens are glycoprotein and they are genetically determined, meaning that you inherit them from your parents. So each parent gives one gene uh, to their offspring. Uh, the A antigen and B antigen genes are dominant. Uh, whilst the O gene is um, is recessive. Um, so normally uh, the immune system works by first being exposed to a foreign antigen before it produces it, the antibodies against it. However, this is not the case for uh, the blood group system. Um, the body has preformed antibodies against the red blood cell antigen that a person does not have. So, for example, uh, there is a person with the blood type of A. So, this means that their all of their red blood cells have the A antigen on their surfaces. So, as you can see. As you can see here on this diagram, so a person with um, with the blood type of A has A uh, antigens on their surface. So the this person will have uh, preformed antibodies against the B antigen, uh, and these antibodies uh, are will be circulating in their blood plasma. So these antibodies, they are called anti-B antibodies. So as you can see in this diagram, person with the group uh, A blood type 
uh, will have A antigens present on their red blood cells and anti B antibodies present in their uh, circulating in their blood plasma. So why does this why why is this? So why do they why does everyone have um, antibodies against uh, the antigen that they do not have? So these antibodies uh, they cause agglutination and they cause hemolysis if they ever encounter the red blood cells with B antigens on their surfaces. So because these anti the, your body will not be uh, accustomed to this foreign antigen that you that you do not have uh, the body the immune system protects itself against this foreign antigen um, so how can a person uh, receive an uh, antigens that are um, that are that, that are not self antigens uh, this can occur through mainly through uh, blood transfusions so this is the uh, this is what happens with a person who who is blood type A. Uh, similarly, an individual with blood type B has preformed anti A antibodies. Um, into individuals with blood type A B uh, who have both antigens, they do not have preformed antibodies to either of these antigens. So they have people with a b blood type they have uh, they have and they do not have any antibodies uh, preformed to uh, these antigens as they as both of these antigens are their self antigens and they are recognized by the immune system as self uh, so finally uh, people with the blood type of o they they do not have either antigen A nor antigen B on their blood, red blood cells, and but they but in their blood plasma they have both anti A and anti B antibodies. So the people with blood type O they have neither antigen A nor antigen B on their red blood cells, but they have anti A and anti B antibodies circulating in their blood plasma this is because obviously if they receive blood that is uh, blood type a or blood type b or blood type ab then this uh, this will not be compatible with their blood type so just a summary of the uh, abo blood group system um, i'll just quickly go over it uh, so there's four different blood types A, B, AB, or O. Um, the group A genotype is AA or AO. So like I said before, um, uh, these antigens are genetically determined and the A antigen, uh, the A antigen gene and the B antigen genes are dominant whilst the O gene is recessive. So for a person to have uh, to be blood type A, they must have uh, both A genes or uh, one A gene and one O gene. Um, so for a person to have a group blood type B, their genotype will be uh, BB or BO and they will have B antigens and anti-A antibodies in their blood plasma. Um, group O uh, genotype will be OO. So meaning they will, a person with a group O uh, blood type, they will have both O genes uh, and neither A nor B antigens on their red blood cell surface, uh, surfaces and they will have both A anti A and anti B antibodies in their blood plasma. Um, and group A, group A B genotype will be uh, when a person has A and B genes. Uh, 
uh, and these will uh, this person will have a and b antigens on their red blood cell surfaces uh, and no and anti a or anti b antibodies in their blood plasma so uh, there's another uh, blood, blood group system which is called rhesus factor uh, the rhesus antigen d can also be on the surface of the red blood cell uh, if present, the, end, the individual is D positive or rhesus positive. But if this antigen D is not pre present on the red blood cell surfaces, then um, the person is rhesus negative. This occurs um, alongside the um, A and B antigens or the blood, A, B, O blood system. Um, so D is D is the most Im clinically important antigen uh, or rhesus factor, um, but there are also C or D or E uh, antigens as well. Um, uh, so there are just like the ABO blood system, there are antibodies against the rhesus factors. Uh, there are anti C, anti D, or and anti E. Uh, antibodies but these are not naturally occurring uh, and they only develop in response to exposure of the antigen uh, for example they are acquired by um, transfusion of incompatible blood or the presence of or even the presence of a rhesus positive fetus in a rhesus negative mother Uh, so, so combining these two uh, blood system, blood group systems together, ABO and the respect blood, blood systems, uh, a person can be um, can be can belong to either of the, to any of the following eight blood groups: Group A, rhesus, rhesus positive or group A rhesus negative, group B rhesus positive or group B rhesus negative, group AB rhesus positive or group AB rhesus negative and group O rhesus positive or group O rhesus negative. So this diagram you can just see um, all of these blood, eight blood groups, eight blood groups And that concludes uh, my lecture. I hope you all enjoyed uh, enjoyed this lecture and everything was understandable. If there if there are any questions, if you do not understand anything, or if you like a uh, if you like a, more of an explanation on anything, then feel free to uh, contact me uh, on my email. Um, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, finally, if I can please ask you to fill in the feedback form, it will only take 30 seconds to a minute and it will be very useful for us uh, in improving our teaching. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for listening and uh, have a nice day.